actually go ahead and open up to Song of Songs 4. And then we're going to use this as the pickup point. I think we already learned that the Lord encourages us when we're struggling with something. And He wants us as a father and also as someone that's intimate with us to dive deeper with Him and lean closer to Him when we're struggling with something versus running away with Him or running away from Him and not getting closer to Him and then getting further and further into darkness or whatever immaturity we're trying to grow out of. So He wants us to run to Him. Um, I think all of us got that already. What we're going to do is talk another layer of the Lord's encouragement when He does that. And so that's going to show itself in prophecy, that's going to show itself in vision, that's going to show itself in prayer and in Scripture. So I'm going to go paint the picture again of what's going on here. Uh, chapter 2, that's when the Shulamite maiden was uh, first introduced to the love of Jesus the encounter of God. Um, she wants to be comfortable with him and stay under the shade of the apple tree. And then winter passes, and then Solomon is asking the Shulamite, come with me to the mountains, come with me to the, to the war zone, to the front lines of the kingdom. And she doesn't go, as we, as we learned the other day. And so she stays there, she receives a dream, and then um, where she had, she couldn't find him. And so she's looking for him, looking for him, looking for him. And then finally Solomon comes and see, he reveals himself in power with uh, warriors and smoke and all of these amazing things. And then that's where on our first day we talked about one. He starts encouraging the Shulamite on um, who she is, her identity, versus um, speaking lies and deceit and destruction over her and curses. Solomon, uh, which is the picture of Jesus, is speaking to the church the encouragement that, it, that the church needs to rise up to the challenge. So that's where we are in chapter 4. And the reason why I want to break this down a little bit more is because I, I believe that God wants to increase the revelation that we interpret His prophetic and His uh, encouragement to us. Versus it just being like a vision and then we're kind of done and then a vision and kind of done. You can actually take a vision as long as the Holy Spirit is putting life on it through the scripture. And you can dive deeper and deeper and deeper into that vision of what he's revealing to you. And so let's go ahead and we're going to look at we're going to look at this section right here. So if you go to verse one, you are fair, my love, behold, you are fair. And then it goes in. Uh, if you look at. On your notes, paragraph B, you're going to see that there's a list of attributes that Solomon describes the Shulamite to have. There's a list of attributes that, uh, you know, metaphorically, Jesus is prophesying over the church. And so that's important because he speaks like that to us. He doesn't just say, only, he does, he does say it, but he doesn't only just say, you're doing a good job. He doesn't only just say, have no fear. He doesn't only just say, you know, uh, I'm going to increase your faith or something. He, he's, he's very deep God, right? He made everything. And so if you look at this, when you have a vision, and we're going to have a time where we're going to ask the Lord to prophetically show us how he sees us and how he, and how he looks at us. In the same way he's doing here. And so I'm going to name a couple of these things off here. Dove's eyes, hair like goats, teeth like shorn sheep, lips like scarlet, kisses of the mouth, vile temples. All of those are agricultural visions, right? Because the maiden, the Shulamite, worked in agriculture. So everything she did was outside in the vineyards. It was outside there catching these little foxes and all these little things. And so the Lord spoke to her in dove's eyes, in shorn sheep, in goat, in like, she would also be around the kingdom, neck like David's tower. And then if you notice later on in the Song of Songs, the Shulamite is speaking to Solomon. And then the Shulamite talks to Solomon with all of the symbolism of a kingdom. Because the Lord, uh, because Solomon lives inside of the kingdom. And so what that means for you is that God might give you a prophetic vision 
that when you go to scripture and you pray about it, it will be your language that he's speaking you to in. So he does that with parables. Like, for example, you had one about bowling. I don't know if you bowl. Do you bowl? Yeah, but you know about bowling, right? Yeah, he knows enough about bowling for God to talk to him about it. Oh, you tried it. Okay. So he know, even he had a revelation with it already where it's like the pin, once you throw it, it goes in and then it comes back because that's a language that he understands. He actually gets that. And so if we know deeper and deeper and deeper the layers of how God speaks to us, you could take a vision and you might have a vision where like the Lord's showing you how he sees you and your eyes are like on fire or something. And then your hair is on, is, it's, it's red and it's glowing. And then your, your clothes are like in warrior's armor that's like white or something. He might speak to you in something like that. And then versus it just being a pretty picture, he might actually be challenging you to dive deeper in what it means. And so let's go ahead and break down a couple of these things. And then we're going to go into the gift of prophecy a bit. All right. So I'm going to go down through here. It says here, you have dove's eyes behind your veil. So dove's eyes, it speaks about the focus of the eyes of the dove. And so whenever you have a vision about eyes they can often represent something about your focus, something about what you're looking at. So that's, a, that's one of the symbolisms with that. Behind your veil, your hair is like a flock of goats. And so your hair, just like as we spoke about with Nazarites, um, I often, I had a vision of uh, Jarel, right? I was praying over Jarel here, and then um, his hair was lit on fire. And then um, I was praying over him. I, told, I don't think I told him that yet. <laughs> so, um, but what that represents is that the Lord is, making, is setting his devotion on fire for him. And so that's a prophetic image of what he's declaring over him. But then also you could see here biblically, that's what that symbolizes a lot in the Bible. Hair represents devotion, oftentimes public and secret devotion. And then it goes down to verse 2. Your teeth are like shorn sheep. As we, um, as we went through um, Hebrews um, 5, you know, milk. Or even in Corinthians, babes drink milk, but adults eat meat. They chew on the word. And so if you look at teeth and milk and solid food, that's something that's used throughout all of the Bible that normally symbolizes the way that you meditate and eat the scroll. You eat the word. The way Ezekiel was, I will eat the scroll. And it was bitter in my stomach. Or um, um, John, when they saw the scroll in Revelations, he ate the scroll. And so, see, if you, if you look at parts of the vision, you could understand more of how much God loves you. Let's go into uh, lips like scarlet. Uh, scarlet is like Rahab. Uh, when she threw the scarlet robe out, they put a, there was, um, your sins are like scarlet. It, it represents, and now they're pure as snow, it represents the redemption of blood, the redemption of sin. So if ever you get a dream and you're like dressed in scarlet, you might be a messenger of redemption or something. And so I have a feeling after we get done with this, God's going to really show you some crazy visions. And so I, I have a vision of me that he speaks to me about. And it get, I've been praying over it for the last eight years. And every single time I get more and more revelation on it, it it's just like I get shocked with another revelation of how much he loves me. All right, let's go to the next one. It goes down and it says uh, veiled temples. So your cheeks, right? If you smile, it shows in your cheeks. It shows in your face. If you're frowning and all that other stuff, your temples are the emotional makeup of your face. And so it's speaking about like pomegranates. It's showing a pomegranate. When you open a pomegranate, you can see the, the reddish color of it, the blushing. It, it shows that your heart is intimate with the emotions of God. And so even when you're prophesying over other people, you might see stuff like this. And then if your eyes are sensitive enough in the spirit to understand God's trying to say not just one thing over this person, he's trying to say like maybe a hundred things over this person. It says in um, the Bible, he has as many good thoughts for us as there are grains of sand on the shore. 
So he's not like, hey, here's one grain of sand, and that's how much I think of you. He has, if you could think of all the island hopping you've ever been, multiply that across the entire universe, and think of all the grains of sand, that's how many good things he has to say about you. He's really not running out of things to say. But he, what he's doing with this is he's revealing in nature, uh, like again, like nature, like Romans 1, that's where he speaks about, you, could, you can never deny the creation of God, God's creation and who he is, because you could look outside, you can already see nature. And so that's why you could already, when you look at nature, he might just speak to you through the trees about the rooting of the word. He might just speak to you through like the budding of the flowers about the character of your life. He might speak to you through an animal. Even here in the Bible, the Solomon called Shulamite a horse on a chariot. And that speaks of the beauty and the power and the strength of her and the perseverance. And so even in nature, you could actually see God talking to you through multiple layers. But he can do that through a lot, he could do that through a lot of things. Because again, he's not running out of things of good to say to us. He's just needing us to understand what's in the word so that we can unpack it more and more. Okay, let's go. And then I think I, I messi- uh, said, said this already. The neck like the Tower of David. If um, the neck is where wherever I turn my neck, that's where the direction of my will is going to go. And so the neck like a Tower of David, if you've ever seen a war tower, it's facing the enemy. You ever, if you ever watched a movie like Lord of the Rings or something or some kingdom thing, then they'll have a tower and then it will be facing the enemy. Then they'll have archers and all these people that can attack it through it and do all these long range and oil or whatever they're doing. I don't know exactly how it works, but then that's, what it, that's how that, that tower defense is. And then so he's saying over even the neck, like if you have a vision of armor on you, and you have a neck guard, like that's actually saying something, right? Or if you have a vision and you have a, like, um, what is this? A scarf around your neck, right? And it might be scarlet or something. He might be saying that the, you know, my will over your life is redemption over everything the enemy took from you and also redemption for everyone that I bring you to, that I'm using you as a messenger for. He, that might just be a, some, I feel like I'm even prophesying right now to some of you. And so that's what the neck means. That's what he's saying over there. The next one is uh, breasts like fawns, which I, that's completely alien to me. The only thing I understand is the milk thing. But um, yeah, so anyways, if you, th- if you think of it in terms of um, what a mother does and what fawns do, is that they nurture. And so she's speaking over to this Shulamite, who is literally a slave in the garden, who's um, single and has nothing to do, that God sees that you have the capability of nurturing and leading other followers. That you're you're not someone that doesn't have that motherhood. You're someone that can actually lead people and do ministry and outflow. And she doesn't do that right now. That's something she will do. But then even for us, if you get a vision of the guys having breasts, Maybe that's not, maybe that's not it. Maybe get a breastplate of righteousness thing on you or something like that. Get, get something else. But um, that's what that means. So if, if that, in biblically, that's what it speaks about, the nurturing of it. I think um, uh, David even said, um, you held me like a mother and I nursed from you. He was talking to God. And some people say that that's why God's a woman, but that's kind of weird. So like, um, but that's where people take that, that context from. But then David understands that in his Psalms. Because um, I don't know about, I don't know if you guys ever preached in the Philippines, but it's very common if I'm preaching for someone to be breastfeeding in the front, like uh, in the Philippines. They get just like no cover at all. And I'm like, what the? So like, because it's just, it's just, that's what moms do. They nurture their kids. And so here, in the ancient times, that's also what they do. They nurture their kids. And so the Lord is speaking about the nurturing, ministering, leadership capability of the woman, or of the Shulamite maiden. All right. So let me see if there's anything else with that. All right. Now what I want you to do is go to um, the administrating prophecy thing that you had. And then after this, we're going to go into a time where you're going to have a time of prayer to receive vision at another level. Okay. All 
All right, so if you look at it, this is part of a larger teaching. There's many, many teachings on prophecy. Uh, there's a couple of people I go to that I really studied, but um, all of them are relatively the same. They, they somewhat relatively stay the same. Okay, so I'm going to start off. This is a very easy way of looking at it. The one thing I like about um, these teachings is that the teaching gift allows you to break it down step by step. When you have a teacher in a, in a room, they take everything that's, they take this intergalactical apostolic prophetic thing, and then they break it down so that every single step is so easy by principle to see. And so this stuff is already broken down, so it's really easy to just kind of apply it. So this is how, okay, how can I receive prophecy? How can I hear the voice of God? And how do I interpret it? What do I do with it? And how do I grow in it? So the first one is um, 1 Corinthians 13, 9. I'm on the first page. Everything that we see is in part. It says this, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. So every time I prophesy or I hear from the Lord, I always assume there's more to it or it's not the full picture. Whether I might not even have the right picture if I'm not sensing it correctly. And so for you too, you don't have to either be ashamed or insecure or not confident if you have the whole thing. Because you probably don't. Because in the Bible, it says you can't. So when it, that's just how it works. We all, when you share a vision, then I share a vision, and you share a vision, and we all come together, we start seeing the full picture of what the Lord is trying to say. And so encouragement works like that too. You might have a little piece of encouragement. Somebody else might have a little piece of counsel. Someone else might have another piece of wisdom. And so when you all get in the same room or the same team, your job as a servant is to pull that out, everyone's part, into the big picture. Because that's how revelation works. It's all in part. Okay, let's go to the, let's go to the next one. Numbers 12, 6, 8. So that's Revelation. He, God, said, hear my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so in my servant Moses. I speak to him face to face, even plainly, and not in dark sayings. And so the, the lifestyle of hearing God's voice is that you just don't see a vision. The lifestyle of hearing God's voice in prayer is that you're constantly getting deeper understanding of what he's telling you. And that's how you dive deeper and deeper and deeper. And so he says this, right? You might get a vision or a dream. One of the first levels of that is that the prophets would receive a vision or a dream that they would have to interpret. And then someone that's, and he does it to anybody, but also people that he wants to speak cleanly to and clearly to, he also does as well. But the idea in both cases is that you're going to have to press in to understand what is it that he's telling me. And that's part of under interpreting uh, revelation. Okay, the next one is the wisdom side of it. Um, if ever you're wondering, how, what's the best book for me to read for really practical stuff? Uh, Proverbs is the first place you should probably go. I've been reading Proverbs for like 10 years almost, probably even more than that. You just read, uh, you can read a chapter a day, there's 31 Proverbs, like 30, 31 days in a year, 29 or in a month. And then so every day you can read something and it will literally tell you everything from how to save your money, from how not to hang out with fools, from how to avoid immorality, to how to make decisions of integrity. It will go through everything in life that you have to deal with. And it will just have principle after principle after principle after principle. So that's wisdom. So with vision and revelation and prophetic, you have to get wisdom to actually do it. The word wisdom means prudence. Prudence means uh, successful at the skill of living life. So you live life successfully. If you, I'm going to go zoom into... Um, I'll go to Proverbs 1. Maybe why don't you go turn with me there? Because this is um, the latter stage of the prophetic. So Proverbs 1, it says why we get prophecies or why we get wisdom and all that. 
this chapter, um, this, this, yeah, this book really changed my life. When, I, when the Lord talked to me about teaching me how to be a dad and teaching me how to be a man of God, the first place he brought me was Proverbs. And then I read it, and I was like, man, I do everything the fool does. And then it says uh, what the wise people do. So then I just started doing that. <laughs> but it's very easy. They will say something like, the foolish person says too many words. And I'm like, wow, I talk a lot. And then it says, but the wise person, even if he doesn't know, will remain silent. And I'm like, so maybe I just remain silent and I'll be wise. <laughs> and it's like that easy. Like it says that. It even says stuff like, um, if you hate instruction, you're stupid. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> and, then, um, and then it will say something like, but those that love counsel will be successful and prosper. And I'm like, hmm. It's just like so simple because it's just how you live life successfully. Okay, let's read Proverbs 1. Because when God reveals something to you, he wants to bring wisdom to our life. So it says the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of the D David, king of Israel. This is the guy who wrote Proverbs is the same person who wrote the Song of Solomon. It's the same person. To know wisdom and instruction to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion, a wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a, a man of understanding will attain wise counsel to understand a proverb and an enigma. The words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so there alone you see that all of the wisdom that God gives you is to be successful. And if it works for someone who's young and naive and doesn't know anything, they could become knowledgeable and have discretion. And it even works for the person who's wise. He could increase in learning. And so wisdom, the limitation of wisdom, is the same limitation of love. It's infinite. It goes on and on and on and on and on. So there's no point of exhausting what wisdom does. If you look at uh, the sphere of science, technology, and economy, and business, uh, let's say artificial intelligence or something like that, what they're saying is that we're missing like a part. If we have this part or this part, or this part, then we just need to upgrade this hardware or this thing or this thing, then we'll have artificial intelligence. But if we were able to change the hardware to get artificial intelligence, we would have had that in the 80s. It wouldn't, have, it wouldn't be non-existent right now. But what they're saying is that it's not that we don't have the hardware, it's we don't have the innovation to even create it. All the stuff that happens in your brain doesn't parallel to the hardware that we have. So in other words, the amount of wisdom in this sphere has already hit its ceiling. We, don't, we haven't exhausted the wisdom in the sphere of economic science and technology. We're not innovating in that arena anymore. We're just multiplying what's already been built or the hardware that's already been scaled or things like that. And so that's what I want to present towards you too. Don't think you have a ceiling on you. Don't think that there's an end of the revelation. Don't think that there's an end to the understanding of your identity. You have an unlimited ceiling, an unlimited uh, expanse of how much God wants to talk to you about his wisdom. And then it even says that when we stop in learning, we become a fool. It says that in, it says that in Proverbs which is just really good. There's a natural uh, illustration of it. If you have any body of water that doesn't outflow, it becomes dead. If you have um, the current of all of the ocean, if there's a deep water current under the whole ocean that moves everything, the nutrients, the life, all these other things under the, the currents of the ocean, if that dies, the whole ocean dies. If we don't keep moving and growing and inflowing and outflowing and learning and applying and getting deeper and deeper, we die as well. It's, a, it's a, like a universal law of how God created everything. So even with wisdom and revelation, there's always more. And there's a, there's a ceiling sometimes 
that he'll hit corporately. And the, the only place where you're going to find it sometimes is your secret place. He's going to say, well, you talk to your friend all day about it. You talk to this. You watch this movie. You looked at this sermon. I want you to go with me and the word and the Holy Spirit, just you and me, to go deep tonight. Or to go deep this weekend. Or to go deep this morning. And there's revelation of our life that he won't give to anybody else. He'll only give it to you when you search for it. And you'll only get that practical piece of wisdom when you ask the Lord and you inquire to the Lord. It was actually really interesting with the fire thing, right? Because we were talking about that in our, in our leadership staff meeting. And um, what I was sensing was that there was a couple of things that needed to happen before we did the room change. Like some of them were just like, waiting for someone's response on a phone and then some other things. And then once we get executed, then we can do it. But I sensed that that was where it was supposed to be. I didn't know anything was going to happen. But then it's like he's, he's constantly talking to us about wisdom. Like all kinds of wisdom in your house. Like all kinds of wisdom when you're brushing your teeth. He's always talking to you about wisdom. We just have to be sensitive to learn. You have, we have to be able to learn with him and his Holy Spirit any place that we are. Okay, let's go ahead and move a little bit forward before we get into um, our times of uh, prayer right now. Okay, so the, the, the vision that you get or the word that God tells you will never contradict the character and nature of God uh, from his scripture. It will never contradict it. So... If you get something that goes against the scripture of the word of God, then it's probably the devil. If you get something that even quotes scripture, but isn't the character of God, it could be the snake deceiving you. Because even Satan quoted scripture to Jesus. But just because he knew scripture, Jesus knew the father. And then he quoted, he knew the spirit of the father. And he knew the heart of the father wasn't the way that the Satan was quoting the scriptures. And so you have to know the heart of the father and you have to know the will of the father in the scripture. Or he could be quoting all these things to you. Did you know that um, America took slavery from the Bible? We quoted a scripture of slavery from African Americans. From, they took it from the Bible. But if anyone knows the heart of God, he would never want to enslave a human being. That's why he died on a cross. But they would take scripture and use that against, uh, use that against, the, use it against the world. All right, so just know that that's the first part too. And there's uh, various areas where you can get that, but I'm going to go into this first. Okay, the next one is, here are the ways that you can receive revelation from God. This is why you don't want your senses dull. If, if your senses are so pumped up on other things, you can't, you can't feel what the Holy Spirit is trying to speak to you. If it's so filled on entertainment, if it's so filled on a crush, like all those kinds of distractions and stuff, like a gecko or whatever, then um, you won't be able to hear what God's saying. Because it says the pure of heart see God. So you want to have a purified heart and you want to have a purified lifestyle. So let's go through what they are. One of them is like a mental picture, right? Some of you uh, receive that on a regular basis. It's where it's almost like this projector comes up in your mind's eye and you're starting to see something. Yeah, you could close your eyes sometimes and you see it or you open your eyes and you see it. It's uh, something like that. Uh, some of you get that a lot more than others. Some of you only get that once in a while, but that's not the only thing. Okay, the next one is emotional stirrings. This one is really key um, even for men, but also for um, women specifically as well too. Because um, what I've noticed too is that women, you have emotion that God gives you, which he gives us too, but it's just different. <laughs> so uh, and we, he speaks to us that way too, but it's just different. But there's a lot of uh, women I know that have a strong gift of discernment. So when they go into an area, they feel stuff. Or when they sit next to somebody, they feel something. Or something like that. Or they're talking to someone, they're just, they feel it. And they may not be able to identify what it is, but they know something's off. 
That's the way that God speaks through emotions. And that could be the same thing for you guys. You could actually, you're, probably, you're a very high sensor. Uh, you could probably go into a, um, <laughs> this probably happened to you. You could probably, you could go into a village, an unreached uh, tribe or a city. And then for those of you that have that gift or that strength, you'll feel it. You might even feel your body shaking because you're like, wow, I feel really cold right now. I feel like there's just a lot of stuff that happened in this house or in this place. So that's not for you to like take that on. What some people try and do is they try and like, okay, there's something super demonic here. I'm just going to receive it. Like that's not what you, that's not what you do. Okay. All right. Okay. I'll tell you a joke so that you can get a story in here. All right. When I was getting saved, uh, yeah, let's use that word, getting saved. When I was getting saved and the Lord was sanctifying me, I went to Francis Chan's church and he wasn't there, but they were doing these um, baptisms in Simi Valley. And um, I didn't read the Bible. I didn't know any of this stuff, but I, I, I just was a strong censor. So I could see things. I could visualize things and all this stuff. And then so they were saying tonight, we're going to have a baptism. And I was like, this is awesome. I don't even think I had a baptism. So they took him, and then they dunked him in the water, and then all these demons started flying out everywhere. It looked like Ghostbusters. And I was like, whoa, look at all the demons, huge. And this one's like, that actually looks like the way they draw it. Like, you know, they, when people get demonized and they draw demons, it's because they're seeing them. They, they're, I'm like, wow, that's actually the way the thing looks. Like, they actually, it moves like that. Because that's why when I see horror movies, I don't watch them anymore because they're super demonic. It's because they actually are flirting with demons. They're seeing a real demon. Demons are real. When they fell, they're angels. They're all over the place. They're one third of them are, are demons. So I was like, whoa, that's crazy. So then something whispered to me, which I knew now is not God. I felt like it was the Holy Spirit. I felt like it was the Holy Spirit because I didn't know anything because I was so stupid. But then um, I felt like this, this voice was speaking to me saying, okay, yeah, I'm going to raise you up as a leader. Receive all these demons so you can conquer them. And I was like, okay, because that's what you do in video games. Like a necromancer or something, you like receive these demons. So you're like, okay, I'm going to receive these demons. I'm going to throw them out. Right? That's why you don't get your, that's why you don't get your, that's why you don't operate with the Spirit from outside of the Bible, okay? Yeah, I got to do it with the Bible because he would never tell you to do that in the Bible. God cast out demons. He doesn't accept them. So anyways, I accept them. And then they just start coming in me, like all of them just fling in me like crazy. And I'm like, I'm cursing. Everything I'm saying, I'm cursing. I can't not curse. I'm just like swearing, swearing, beep, 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 beep. And I'm just like freaking out and I'm like freaking just walk out of this Simi Valley church and then I'm like going to my car and I'm just cursing like Donald Duck who doesn't even curse but whatever I'm just going crazy in this place and then um I, I'm like the only thing I could do is um try and speak in tongues because I'm giving him I'm giving the demons authority over me because they can't possess you. They can't control you. You're already, you got the Holy Spirit. But you could be a dummy and tell them, do whatever you want with me. Because that's what you do with your voluntary life. You could volunteer yourself back to demons and all that stuff. So I was stupidly volunteering myself to the dark side. And then, so all I could do is pray in the Spirit. And I, if I knew more, I could have just not done it, but whatever. So anyways, because I didn't read the Bible. So I'm just trying to do this, trying to figure out what I know. I'm just praying in the Spirit. And then I text my friend and I tell him, Hey, dude, I think you need, to, um, you need to deliver me, and you need to baptize me. And he's all like, um, he's like 21 or something. And he's like, oh, okay, why don't you just come over to my house? So I go over to his house, and I'm like freaking out, <laughs> just cursing and all this stuff. And then, um, and then I get there, and I start writing on the paper what's happening to me. And then he can't read any of it. He's all I did. It looks like he told me after I got baptized, he said, you know, when you wrote, you look like a chicken that scratched on a paper, right? And I was like, yeah, whatever. He still understood what I said. So um, I told him, he said, all right, this is what I know in the Bible. Because both of us don't know what to do. Because both of us don't read the Bible. So, that's, so we're trying to figure this thing out. And then he's like, this is what I know about demons. You got to cast them out and you got to get baptized. So I'm like, all right. So he starts praying for it. Nothing happens. And then I'm just freaking out and doing all this stuff. And then he starts having visions that 
um, the devil's trying to speak your old identity over you and you're not demonic anymore. You're not devil possessed. You're free and the devil's lying to you. I had this vision. He had this vision of me in the middle of a, a street, an inner city street in the hood. And then I was just sitting there and all these spotlights were on me and all these demons were like all over me. Like, you know, in a gang fight, they like come over and they fight you and they all just stand around you, beat you up. All these demons were all over me like this. And then he was saying, all you have to do is walk away. Like you're going back to the thing. You, this thing has no more power over you. And I was like, I don't know what that means. Just <laughs> like do it, like just baptize me or something. So, anyways, he takes me, and then um, he puts super, super cold water in the tub, because um, he, I, I, like he told me later, I was like, dude, why was the water freezing? And then he said, well, I just looked at John the Baptist, and it was a river, bro, and like they like they like baptize in winter, and I'm just thinking when they came out of prison, they just dunked them in the river. So I was like, if we're gonna baptize you, it should probably be cold water. So anyways, I step in the thing, and it's so cold, it shocks me everywhere. And I'm all like, ah! So, so anyways, I'm like getting in there and like freaking out and all this stuff. And then he baptizes me, and then I come out, and then I'm like giggling like a little girl. And I'm like, see, I'm like, ah! And then I'm like so happy, and I'm like a little boy and stuff like that. So anyways, that's what, when you take on emotional stuff or visual stuff, you're not the one that takes them on. Okay, that's a very hyper experience of that. <laughs> but it could be anything. It could be depression. It could be suicide. It could be um, lying about your identity. It could be anything. You might be around someone that's super lonely, and then all of a sudden you just start getting codependent with each other. Because you don't know. It's like, wait, wait, wait. This isn't, this is what is happening right now. This isn't what I'm supposed to agree with. This is what I'm supposed to intercede against. This is what I'm supposed to go in the opposite spirit with, like what uh, Paola was saying last night, that uh, right after someone spoke negativity to her, she went to the store and bought all the baby stuff, right? And so when you feel something that's not the character and nature of God in any of these stirrings, you go in the opposite spirit of it. So don't go in the same spirit of it, which is what I did for quite some time, but you go in the opposite spirit of it. So if someone's feeling super depressed, then you start declaring joy, you start declaring encouragement, you start declaring the love of God, you start maybe speaking life over somebody, um, you start serving somebody, you start going in the opposite spirit of what the thing is. That's what you do with your emotional stirrings. Okay, the next one is the, um, the sympathetic pains. So this could be... Um, this could be a part of your body. For example, um, if, you're, um, if you're like, let's say your foot hurts or something, or your back, you might get this when you're praying over somebody, you might feel your, like your back hurts or your kidney or something. And so that's God telling you that he wants you to pray over somebody's pain, and he wants to see it healed. And so you might be with someone here even, uh, which we're going to have time to do that uh, as well. And then you might just be praying for somebody, and then all of a sudden it's like your shoulder hurts. And you're like, man, my shoulder really hurts. And then you ask them, hey, does your shoulder hurt, your left one? And they're like, yeah, it does. You've been hurting for like a week. <laughs> Aldrin. And then, um, and then uh, oh, let me massage it, <laughs> actually. Maybe let's, so let's pray for it, right? Then you pray for it, and then God does it. I remember one time this person had a really bad back pain. He couldn't stand straight. And then the Lord said, um, I want to use you for healing. And I was like, no, you don't, because I don't want to heal anyone. And then he said, I'm going to use it for you. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to do anything. Like, so anyways, I walk up, and then I pray for the guy's back, and I feel it. And then I feel a warmth happening in my back and my hand. And then all of a sudden, his back clicked. And I was like, whoa! I was like, hey, did you, did you feel that? He's like, yeah, my back pain's gone. And I was like, praise God! And then he walked away. And then I walked back. <laughs> but then like, yeah, you don't know what's going to happen if you're sensitive to those things. So that's another way, right? Don't just be sensitive to your emotion, your vision, and the hearing. Be sensitive to your physical body. That's something that you want to be able to know as well. All right, let's go to um, physical sensations. This is not just body parts of sympathy, but this is also like, um, uh, yeah, you might feel stuff like this too. Like right now, I feel a gust. That's the fan. But sometimes you might actually be standing somewhere, and you feel like a, like a gust, 
and there's no fan or there's no gust, right? That might be the Holy Spirit like blowing on you, trying to tell you he wants to bring a, a wave of his wind into the people or something. Because the gushing wind was an act too. There was one time uh, we were praying against witchcraft for the house of prayer. And we were cutting off, um, we, all of us, there was like six of us or eight of us, we were prophesying and interceding for the, for, we saw this giant spider in the spirit that was over the house of prayer. And then it was uh, making this web all over the place. And then we started uh, interceding against the web and the witchcraft of this giant spider. And um, over like a period of maybe 30 minutes, it, it, we finally cut it off and it was done. But while we were praying, spider webs were falling from the ceiling. And they were landing on us. And then we had uh, feathers that were coming out from, from around us too. Because the angels were warring against the demons. And then the Lord was telling, I was praying it in the spirit. And you know, when you pray in the spirit, you don't know if something's happening or something's not happening. It's just faith. At this point, I didn't know it was happening. I just felt like something was happening. And then God had the, the webs and the feathers to confirm what you guys are doing is real. Imagine, imagine this, right? Uh, if you ever think about uh, the power of prayer, right, and you're trying to figure out if it's real or not, just imagine if there was a witch that had a puppet of you, and it, was, it looked just like you. And then they were squeezing the neck, and they were poking it with needles, and every day they were casting curses on it nonstop, not eating, putting pig's blood on it all day. Like, that's going to do something. And if you're not interceding and you're not with the Lord and you're not sensitive and you're spiritually dull, you're just going to accept the warfare. But if you're sharp, you're pure at heart, you're loving Jesus, you're declaring your identity, you know who you are with the blood of Jesus, all those lies can't attack you. And so you have to know that there's a place where prayer is not defense. Prayer is offense. It allows you to attack. It allows you to move forward. Okay, this is John 5, 19. It says, The Son can do nothing of Himself but what He sees the Father do. So this is Jesus. Jesus doesn't do anything until He gets a revelation of what the Father is doing. And so that's the way that um, you made a really good point too. Um, you know, where's my shoes? Like in the fire. Like where's my, where's my luggage? Oh man! Where are my Pokemon cards or whatever? Like, you know, you're looking for all this random stuff. And then, and then you're like, why don't we just pray and ask the Lord what we're supposed to do? He's saying, run out of the building. <laughs> so like, right? It's like in every moment, you do what the Father says. You're always praying constantly. You always have a priority of prayer in your life. I think yesterday was a good example where the Lord is saying, you're praying. And he's saying, pray more. For everything, pray in every situation, pray in abundance, pray in lack, pray in protection, pray in attack, pray in everything. I think he's preparing us. He's training us in his own Holy Spirit way. Okay, here's another one. Okay, this is where you have to break off uh, shame and intimidate. Then you have to break off identity that's not yours. Um, you have to keep that you're a child of God. This is James 4 too. It says, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And so that's in context of a couple of things. But the principle of that is sometimes we just don't hear from God because we just don't talk to him. We just don't ask him about ourselves. We just don't ask him about somebody else. We, don't, we just simply don't pray. And so it says in the Bible, if you pray, if you ask, you might actually receive what the Holy Spirit wants for you. And so just have that courage to be able to do that. Um... All right, I'm going to go to the last one, and then I'm going to go over these next three points, and then we're going to, then we're going to do this, all right? So you can go to uh, paragraph G. All right, so this is where um, we're also going to be going through this in the workshops, but um, what you do when you receive a prophetic revelation and you receive the wisdom is you have to give some kind of expression to it. Whether it's a song, whether it's writing it down, whether it's acting it out, you know, whatever it is that the Lord's showing you, you have to be able to express it, excuse me, some way. And so that's where all of your creativity, that's where all your vision, uh, essentially a lot of your creativity comes in this point. It could even just be writing it down. It could be keeping it in your heart and creating a space in your heart for it. But you have to give an expression to what uh, the Holy Spirit is trying to express to you. 
Okay, the next one is, in the midst of all of the heat and all of the stuff going on, not physical heat, but just like when things start happening prophetically or with the Holy Spirit talking, you have to dial down all of your emotions. You have to, if you're like freaking out, not the fire, let's just think about life or whatever. If you just, if you're anxious, if you're like, I don't know what to do, you got to dial it down. I really got to go to the bathroom, just dial it down, right? If you want to like, I really want some coffee, just dial it down. Just dial everything down and just listen to the still small voice like he spoke to Elijah. And then just, you know, just get into that place of peace and dial down and then just let the Holy Spirit talk to you. However, he's going to talk to you in one of those languages. That's one of that. Okay, the next one, it says in the Bible, don't despise prophecy. So that's why I'm always so, I feel like people that don't listen to the Holy Spirit, they miss out so much because he's alive. Like you can't neglect the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's real. He's alive. He's like moving around and hovering and talking to people and he's in us and he, ha- he has emotions. Like he's a real Holy Spirit. Like it's a Holy Spirit. I don't even think it's a he or she, but it's like Holy Spirit's real. So when we start going like the Holy Spirit is going to talk only through the word. He's not going to talk to you. He's not going to share anything else. It's like, well, he does a lot more than just talk through the word. Like he's in the word, but he's alive. Like he's real. Like if you start taking out the Holy Spirit, you lose so much stuff. Like even the Great Commission, it wouldn't even be near complete if we didn't have the Holy Spirit because he's the one giving out the wisdom. He's the one showing us what we need to do. So anyways, that's the other thing too. You want to value whatever he gives you. Whatever how small, I always do this. Um, Sometimes people ask me, how do you hear the Holy Spirit so much? And so I don't hear him all at once when I'm prophesying. So the the way that I hear God, which is the way he says it in the Bible, is I might be praying over one of you, right? And then uh, let's just say even all of you. I'm seeing it right now. I didn't see anything else but all of their hair is on fire again. I don't know why I keep seeing that. But I saw your hair on fire, even though you need to sleep earlier. I saw your hair on fire. I saw your hair on fire. All of your hairs were on fire. And then I can dive deeper into that. I can say that the Lord is going to consecrate you. He's telling you things that you never felt filled with at all anyways. You would do these things over and over and over and over, and they would bore you. And then you'd have to find something else and find something else and find something else. And he's going to set your life on fire. He's going to give you something that when you take it, you're going to want more and more and more and more and more. And you're going to, the way you stand is going to change. The way you talk is going to change. The way you speak is going to change. Everything about you is going to change. And he's going to make you a burning man of God. And everyone's going to know you as, oh yeah, those guys, they're like burning ones for God. They're when I, I, I don't even want to talk to them. They might just rebuke me or get something from the Lord. I don't know what they're seeing right now. And, they're, and your eyes are going to turn like fire when you look at people. You're going to see the poorest of the poor. You're going to see the riches of the rich. But you're going to see beyond all of that. You're going to start seeing the identity that God has for them. And you never even met them in their life. And so I didn't see any of that. The only thing I saw was their hair on fire. But then I kept in faith knowing, okay, that's in part. This is in part. This is in part. There's something more. There's something more. I could have prophesied over you for two hours. Like Ember was there when I used to have this little house church. And I used to like just prophesy over people for like an hour or two. And then you just nonstop until I realized you need to go to the Bible and get that. So like that's, that's what it is. It's just part. You just go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Okay. Let's go ahead and let's just go ahead and close our eyes right now. And um, I want you to um, hear from the voice of God right now. And I want you to um, ask, ask yourself, uh, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, I ask that you would reveal how I look to you, God. Lord, I ask that you would reveal how much you love me, God. That you would be the one that speaks your identity over me, God. That I wouldn't receive that from somebody else. I wouldn't receive that from from another person. 
But Lord, I want more of how all those grains of sands of good thoughts towards me, God. I want you to speak that over me, not the lies of the devil, not the lies of the world, not the TV, not the entertainment, not the pornography or the YouTube or the movies, not the, the, the video games and all this stuff. God, I want you to tell me my identity as a man or a woman of God of you. Lord, we just, we, we just declare the increase of hearing the Spirit right now, God. Lord, we, we declare an increase of, of the prophetic right now, God. An increase of vision and signs and wonders and, and hearing the voice of the Lord. And when He gets something, when you get something, don't stop there. Just say, what is that, Lord? Why are you showing me this? Keep inquiring of the Lord. And don't do it by understanding. Do it by faith. And just let take him, let him take you through that vision. Let him take you through that word. And just go deeper and deeper and deeper with the Lord. And just go ahead and do this, and then we're gonna have a time where we can unpack as a as a team and see what the Lord is saying to all of us.